On this week's Vaticano, we follow Pope Francis on his trip to the northern Italian city of Turin, where he prays at the shroud and remembers St. John Bosco. Concerned parents gather in Rome to contest the Italian government's pending decision for a compulsory sexual education in opposition to the Catholic faith. The highly anticipated encyclical of the Pope, Laudato Si, is officially launched in the Vatican. All this, plus the 120th successor of St. Francis of Assisi, tells us about his order and we discover the underground treasures of Rome's catacombs. For all this and more, stay tuned. You're watching Vaticano. Pope Francis made a two-day apostolic visit to the northern Italian city of Turin on June the 21st and 22nd. He was marking the 200th anniversary of the birth of St. John Bosco and praying at the Holy Shroud of Turin. Upon arrival, the Pope's first encounter was with workers in the main city square, the Piazza Reale. He was greeted by a farmer, an entrepreneur, and a working mother, and then had some words prepared for the assembly. The work is not necessary for the economy, but for the human person, for his dignity, for his citizenship, and for his social inclusion. Turin is historically a point of attraction for work, but today, we can feel the crisis strongly. In this situation, we are called to say no to an economy of waste which leaves those living in absolute poverty excluded. We are called to say no to corruption, which is so widespread and which seems to be an attitude and a moral behavior. But not just with words, but with actions. No to the dealings of the mafia, no to fraud, no to bribes, and those things. After addressing the workers, the Pope walked to the Cathedral of St. John the Baptist nearby, where he spent a few moments in prayer before the Shroud of Turin, revered by many as the burial cloth of Jesus. It's a rare opportunity since the last exhibition was held five years ago. Before that, it was displayed for the public just four other times in the last 40 years. He then continued to spend a few moments in prayer before the altar dedicated to the young blessed Pier Giorgio Frassati, born in Turin. Then one of the most anticipated events, an outdoor mass on the Vittorio Veneto Square. In his homily, the Pope spoke about trusting God. The Holy Spirit helps us to be ever aware of this moment of being a rock which makes us stable and strong, facing small or great sufferings, which render us capable to not shut ourselves in the face of difficulties, but to take life with courage and to always look into the future with hope. After Mass, Pope Francis prayed the Angelus with the faithful, recalling St. John Bosco. Recalling the apostolic zeal of many holy priests of the land, starting from Don Bosco, of whom we recall the bicentennial of his birth, I greet you priests and religious with gratitude. You strongly commit yourselves to your pastoral work and are close to the people and their problems. I encourage you to pursue your ministry with joy, always focusing on what is essential and proclaiming the gospel. And as I thank you, Brother Bishops of Piedmont, for your presence, I urge you to be close to your priests with fatherly affection. Pope Francis went off to lunch at the Archbishop's residence. He ate together there with young detainees of a juvenile prison and immigrants. St. John Bosco, or just Don Bosco, was an Italian priest and educator who is famous for his outstanding work with the youth of the 19th century. He founded a religious congregation to help poor children in Turin during the Industrial Revolution, called the Salesians. The institute is named after St. Francis de Sales. So, after a successful morning session, Pope Francis met with his successors, the Salesians and the Daughters of Our Lady of Help of Christians. Pope Francis took a lot of time to greet many of them personally. He spoke off the cuff for the attentive assembly, talking about the model of piety of St. Bosco. Even today, there are people, 
not you, that are not necessarily put off by the Virgin Mary, but they don't speak of Mary with the same love with which Don Bosco spoke of her. And when he wanted to ask something of God, he asked the Madonna. And he risked a lot. The second love of Don Bosco was the Eucharist. That was visible in his attitude and in the liturgy. Today, in the Salesian family, you have to do the same. You have to help the youth to enter into the ministry of the Eucharist. You have to help the youth enter into the mystery of the Eucharist. And I see often Eucharistic adoration, and you know that is a good thing. After a brief visit with the disabled in the church of Cotolengo, Pope Francis went on to meet the young people who eagerly awaited his coming. The World Youth Day Cross was received by the crowd in Turin, and he spoke again freely to the young people. You know that it is ugly to see a young person on hold who lives, but who, if you allow the expression, lives like a vegetable, does things, but the life is not there. He doesn't really move, he is on hold. Do you know how many sadness is in the heart of a young person who already are retired with 20 years of age? Yes, they age quickly. That's what prevents a young person from going into retirement, is the will to love, the will to give that which is the most beautiful in man. That is also the most beautiful for God, since the definition that St. John gives God is, God is love. As long as the young person loves, he lives, grows, and does not go on retirement. He grows, 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 always more. As a closing moment, Pope Francis greeted families and some pilgrims individually. Day two, Monday, was characterized by an ecumenical gesture. Pope Francis was welcomed by the Waldensians in Turin. This was the first ever visit of a pope to this evangelical denomination. The Waldensians were founded in the 12th century by a wealthy merchant from Lyon, France, Pierre Waldo. The group was later excommunicated by the church. Today, the Waldensians are united with the Methodist Church of Italy and claim 45,000 followers, mostly in Italy, Argentina, and Uruguay. During a speech to a few hundred people in the Waldensian Temple of Turin, Francis apologized for the sometimes troubled relationship between the Catholic Church and this group of Christians. Siamo profondamente grati al Signore nel constatare che le relazioni We are therefore deeply grateful to the Lord for our constant relations between Catholics and Waldensians today. Since they are today in a respectful relationship of charity and fraternity. There were many occasions which have contributed to the consolidating of this relationship. I think, just to name a few examples, also the Reverend Bernardini has done the same. Collaboration in the publication of an interconfessional Bible in Italian, in the pastoral work of matrimony, and more recently, the redaction of a common call to end violence against women. Among them, many cordial contacts in diverse local contexts where we share prayer in the study of scripture, I want to recall the ecumenical exchange of common goals. An occasion of Easter in Pinerolo, of the Waldensians, and of the local diocese. After the visit to the Waldensian temple, Pope Francis returned to the bishop's residence and received some of his Italian relatives in a strictly private audience. Among them were six of his cousins along with their families. He celebrated mass for them in the chapel of the residence and then they had lunch together. That afternoon he left for Rome. It was a memorable stay for both the Pope and the people of Turin. The most important moment was during mass on Sunday when the Pope called Turin his true homeland. Maria Consolata Mary Consolatrix, Queen of Turin and Piedmont, may strengthen your faith, ensure your hope, and enrich your love, so that you may be salt and light of this blessed earth of which I am a nephew. Keeping these words in their hearts, the people greeted the pontiff farewell. Welcome back. This is Vaticano. 
Pope Francis visited the northern Italian city of Turin for the 200th anniversary of St. John Bosco's birth. But the roots of Don Bosco go way back and connect to yet another saint, a friend since Don Bosco's youth, Don Cafasso. Father Giuseppe Cafasso was a significant social reformer in early 19th century Turin. He encouraged and supported Don Bosco in the work of caring for the street boys of the city, giving them training in various trades. One uh, was the formation of the priests, because here there was the convito ecclesiastico, that means the place where the, the young priests were formed to, uh, to become confessors. So the moral theology and all that. Uh, and of course it was very important uh, for St. John Bosco, uh, because St. John Bosco uh, wanted to go to the missions, but he said, uh, open the window, go, see the children playing in the street, your uh, mission is with them. So he stayed in Turin, etc. Cafasso was the confessor of Don Bosco during his work in Turin. The legacy of the sanctuary to which Don Bosco had a special relation remains intact. Every sanctuary is a place of mercy because of the confession, because of the meeting with God with prayer, the meeting with the others, information, in, uh, uh, all the, the activities that we have in this church. Cafasso died in 1860 when the college he had headed until his death moved to the Shrine of Our Lady of Consolation in the center of the city in 1870. His remains were re-entered there. Pope Francis received Moran Mor Ignatius Ephraim II, the Patriarch of the Syriac Orthodox Church, in audience. Pope Francis spoke about the strengthening of the bonds of brotherhood and friendship between the churches of Rome and of Antioch, and suggested to find a solution to the violence in Syria together, helping the suffering Christians. The Syrian Orthodox Church traces its history to the first Christian communities established in Antioch. Ephraim II was elected the 123rd Syrian Orthodox Patriarch of Antioch in 2014. After the cordial meeting, the Pope prayed for peace together with the Patriarch and the Redemptoris Mater Chapel in the Vatican. The Pope last Friday met with members of the Italian Biblical Association on the occasion of the 43rd National Bible Week. The encounter with the Holy Father marks the beginning of commemorations of the 50th anniversary of Dei Verbum, the Second Vatican Council's dogmatic constitution on divine revelation of 1965. Though it is hard to correctly understand the Word of God, he said that now more than ever we need scriptures. In order for the faith to shine, to not be suffocated, it must be constantly nourished by the Word of God. Francis met with Italy's top Special Olympics athletes on Friday, encouraging them and all athletes to make sports a place for loyalty, human dignity and joy. It is my hope that you all might live the upcoming games in a joyful, passionate, serene manner. Have fun, said the Pope. <laughs> The Pope held a June 19th audience for Italy's 150 delegates to the Special Olympics 2015 World Games. The event will be held in Los Angeles, California, July 25th to August 2nd. In his general audience, Pope Francis spoke about conflict in family life and their effect. In today's catechesis, we reflect on the wounds that occur in the family life. They come from words, actions and omissions which instead of expressing love, hurt those nearest and dearest, causing deep divisions among family members, above all between husband and wife. If these wounds are not healed in time, they worsen and turn into resentment and hostility, which then fall to the children. On June 18th, here in the Vatican, the new encyclical of Pope Francis on the environment was presented to the world. The 185-page-long encyclical calls humanity to conversion, to a greater awareness of the interrelationship of man and nature.
The encyclical takes its name from the invocation of St. Francis of Assisi, Laudato si mi signore, praise be to you my lord, which is the canticle of the creatures, and calls to mind that the earth, our common home, is like a sister, with whom we share our life, and a beautiful mother, who opens her arms to embrace us. Orthodox Bishop Metropolitan John Ziziulas of Pergamo represented an ecumenical voice at the presentation. John Schellenhuber from Germany, a climate change specialist, and Carolyn Wu of Caritas Relief Services representing business, as well as an Italian professor, Valeria Martano, also gave a testimony working with the marginalized. Professor Sean Huber is founder and director of the Potsdam Institute for Climate Impact Research. He debunked a myth that was widespread in the media in weeks prior. Now there is another myth which I would like to share, namely that there are too many people on Earth and they are destroying the environment. So there are many poor people on Earth uh, with their emissions are jeopardizing the human enterprise. This is utterly wrong. So the bottom billion has almost nothing, but on the vertical axis, it's the emissions of that part of humanity. And you see the bottom billion doesn't contribute anything to greenhouse gas emissions. It's all done by the upper billions. So it's not poverty that destroys the environment. It is wealth, consumption, and waste. And this is reflected in an encyclical. The Orthodox Bishop Ziziulas emphasized that this topic unites the Christian confessions. The threat posed to us by the ecological crisis similarly bypasses or transcends our traditional divisions. The danger facing our common home, the planet in which we live, is described in the encyclical in a way leaving no doubt about the existential risk we are confronted with. This risk is common to all of us, regardless of our ecclesiastical or confessional identities. Um, also, business has to concentrate on its essence in order to participate in this large-scale project initiated by the Pope. It's not just an economic undertaking. It is a human enterprise. And because it is a human enterprise, Business must be by people, for the people. And that if it is business as usual, not many of us will be around to really enjoy its benefits. The encyclical is available in electronic form on the Vatican website in eight languages. Welcome back. You're watching Vaticano. The religious order, founded by St. Francis of Assisi, the Friars Minor, commonly known as Franciscans, has been re-examining the way they work in the world. Every six years we come together, we, we have three steps in the process. We come together first to evaluate how we have been trying to live faithfully the gospel, what has been uh, our adherence to, the, to our rule in life. Uh, we try to look at the impact we are having through evangelization on the world, and then we try to listen to questions that have been arising from the different contexts of the world because we are present in 112 countries. Uh, there were 127 um, people present for the participants in the chapter, so we, we're trying to just listen to one another and to discover what maybe God is calling us to in the world today. The general chapter focused on how Franciscans can live out their identity of minority and fraternity more fully in the world today. I think the biggest challenge for us is to, to really be men of prayer, to be men uh, who are courageous with our faith, to be men of hope, tremendous hope, and to be men of joy. Uh, sometimes, uh, like everyone else's life, we get caught up in, in our work, we get caught up in the daily duties, and sometimes we don't take enough time to step back and to listen to the Spirit of God speaking to us. They also tackled issues like their financial situation. The Pope met with the delegates to the general chapter of the Order of Friars Minor during their meeting on May the 26th in Rome. As Franciscans, the Order also has a special insight regarding Pope Francis's upcoming encyclical, whose title is taken from a prayer by St. Francis. 
there are three moments, three moments that represent three moments in the life and the conversion of Francis, three moments that represent the history of, of all of humanity and creation. The first moment is where Francis gives praise to God, solely for God who is God's goodness and love. And he moves immediately to that, from that into giving praise to God through creation, that creation, because creation lives in harmony with, it, with itself, it's able to give God, it's actually a service to God and has its own proper dignity. As Pope Francis has already stated, and as Pope Benedict, Benedict himself stated, that our failure to show respect toward the natural environment is a reflection of our failure to respect toward ourselves. So if we can't respect ourselves, we will not be able to respect the natural environment. We will see it as something we, from which we can just simply keep pulling what we need, as we do in sometimes our human relationships. So I think the Laudate Si is going to be a call for us to a total conversion of all aspects of our lives. Franciscans thus follow in the footsteps of the man of peace, St. Francis. Pope Francis has repeatedly expressed that there is an ideological colonization in the realm of human family and sexuality. Now in Rome, a new compulsory sex education for children of the youngest age is being implemented in schools but many Romans oppose it. Meetings and even a demonstration through the streets of Rome have already taken place to give voice to the concerned parents. It is a call that goes out to the normal people, families and kids, children and the movement of strollers. We have not contacted parties or associations as such. We only wanted to say, come, families, we want to give you a voice and we want to emphasize the great value of the family in society and by family we mean that which is written in Article 29 of the Italian Constitution, a natural society based on matrimony. Those pushing gender ideology are well organized. The strategy is winning since it is not presented as a gender theory as such, but is masked and introduced into the schools on a great scale, socially very important in the fight against bullying and the fighting of discrimination in general and within the sexual orientation in particular. They say, since in the schools there is bullying amongst the children, for example, when there is a weaker or more isolated child, she will be bullied and she will be called unacceptable names, she is discriminated and separated from the others. So in order to avoid this kind of behavior, what is to be criticized, obviously, the idea of indifferentism is introduced. To not discriminate anybody, everybody can be what he wants to be, up to the point of getting rid of all categories of reference, just to avoid the discrimination of a few. This strategy is not unique to Italy. All over Europe, this indifferentism ideology is spreading, but so is the pushback. We have a harmonious collaboration and there is exchange with the Manif pour tout in France, but not only. There are other pro-life committees all over Europe, especially in France, Germany and Spain, but also Poland and others. We today, during the demonstration on June 20th, speak to Italy, but we want the message to arrive in all of Europe. What remains to be seen is if the political leaders will hear the wishes of their voters. Rome's archaeological treasures are doubtlessly some of the most beautiful in Europe and the world. Yet it cannot be forgotten that not all the treasures are visible, at least not above ground. Enter into a hidden world of the early Christians, the catacombs of St. Callistus and its new museum that was opened last week. Uh, today we are inaugurating the complex, the museum, the widespread museum of the complex of St. Calixtus. Because all the parts of this complex we are going to visit tomorrow are part of uh, just one but big and huge museum that is the Comprensory of St. Calixtus. 
The complex is indeed widespread. It covers 90 acres of land with galleries that amount to 12 miles, an underground labyrinth sometimes called the Little Vatican. Today, visitors can enter and experience a time warp back to the roots of Christianity. There is about 400 of these fragments of great importance. We have made a careful selection and have chosen the 100 most important ones. Some of them we have also taken from other catacombs. Some were hidden in some cubicles and not visible to tourists. With this, we have created a themed visit, so you can pass from the pagan culture of antiquity towards the rising of Christianity by way of marble, sculptures, sarcophagi and other fragments to arrive to the Christians and their epigraphs. The restoration just finished and the archaeologists are proud to present it to the public. It's a very long work but it's worth the, the time it took because today we can um, we are able to see some of the most important artifacts and paintings of the third century AD, the first periods in which the early Christian uh, figurative imagery was starting to develop. St. Calixtus will be the most visited catacomb, so we want to shed light on it. We have made it new, fresh, more welcoming, with more things to see. These catacombs were also the official burial place of nine popes and of eight dignitaries of Rome's third century.